deep you surround me with a soul of deliverance from my enemies until all my fears are gone and I'm no longer a slave are drowned in perfect love You rescued me so I could stand and sing I am a child of God You split the sea You split the sea so I could walk right through are drowned in perfect love. 
your perfect love. You rescued me so I could stand and see I am a child of God. I am a child of God. And I'm no longer a slave to fear. the truth you spoke over me no fear can hinder now every promise you made it's true nothing can hinder your love Me break, you call. 
call me out beyond the shore into the way. There's nothing worth more than will ever come close. Nothing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. I'll taste it and see how the sweetest of love. Oh, your presence. We can abide together in your presence. As you just want to spend time with us.
good to me.
Lord, we honor you this morning. We honor you this morning. We honor you. We honor all the attributes of who you are. But today, Lord, we just recognize the mother side of who you are. The nurturer, the comforter, the lover. Lord, we thank you that you inspire mothers in this building and how to be godly mothers. Lord, mothers who care for their children like you care for us. Mothers who carry and gather their, their young under their wing and just protect them and speak life over them and love them like you do for us. I sense such a sweet and tender feeling this morning. He loves you. 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 And he doesn't stop loving you, and he loves you even more than you can even think. And when you're alone and you don't know where to go or where to turn, he's there. Without saying a word, he comforts. Lord, we just honor that in you this morning. And we honor the moms here today, the mothers. And we just speak life over them. Lord, fill them from the bottom of their feet to the top of their head with just supernatural overflowing power and grace to do the things their hearts desire. And that includes people who walk in that attribute. We even honor the men who've laid aside their masculinity at times to embrace and in love like a mother. Because in it you are found, because you are love, you are love. And we just say this morning, Lord, love us. Just love us. Embrace us, hold on to us. Encourage us. Empower us. Knit us closer to you. Help us understand who you are in all facets and nature of who you are. Thank you. I just keep seeing this morning, probably because I was studying it, but I just kept seeing it and just a mother hen scooting the little chicks with her wing to keep them out of danger. And when she gets them all gathered, she sits in her nest and she holds those baby chicks close by in the, her warmth and under her wing. And those chicks feel safe to grow. They feel safe to grow because they feel and hear the heartbeat of their mother. In their closeness and in their intimacy and under her wing, they feel who she is. And they know that they can rest and that they can grow. And our God holds us under the shadow of his wing and we get to hear his heartbeat and we get to rest 
And we get to receive in warmth and in comfort and understand in our intimacy his nature. And we get to be refreshed. So Lord, I just thank you for your refreshing touch today. Lord, those worn out by emotional things, those who have been going through stressful times, Lord, I just thank you for your refreshing this morning. Just refresh this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning and happy Mother's Day to the mothers in the house. We love you. We love every bit of you. No, really, let's, yay. Because each and every single one of us, regardless if we had a good mom or a bad one or one who didn't represent very well, still had a mother, and we wouldn't be here because of our mother. So today, we're going to honor mothers. And... I'm really excited about it. But before we do, let's do a little family business and greet one another and love on one another. And if the Lord leads you in giving anything, there's a basket somewhere and Alexa will take if you have credit or debit, she'll take it. And just do what the Lord tells you and you will never be disappointed. All right.
All right, good morning. Again, good morning. <laughs> Thanks, Alvaro. <laughs> That's hilarious. Oh. I love this body. I love that we're just family. It's just family reunion every Sunday. I love it. I really loved what Mark and Deborah said last week and just that it was funny because, you know, we went through the whole rigmarole of having a family meeting and then he comes in and it's like, ah, you read our mail and yep, 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 yep. You know, it was just really good. It just confirmed what the Holy Spirit's deciding that he's going to do. It's really a neat thing. Um, so, Mark Rich was originally supposed to teach this message this morning, and I got a call last night at 9.30. So, we're going to, yet again, wing it. <laughs> and it seems to always happen on holidays. So, <sighs> so today is Mother's Day. It's kind of cool. Like, I love mothers as we all do, but I want to do something a little bit different, and I mean really different. I want to kind of stretch your thinking, stretching your concept. Um, I feel the Holy Spirit on it. It feels kind of like dangerous territory, so just bear with me, understand my heart. I'm not veering away from anything that's in the word. I'll back it up with the word, but I'm just like, okay, we're just going to go for it. Um, last night, Ed, it was working at Foodlands because I had to work during the day. So she had to stay at home with Sammy. So my mother-in-law's already gone to Hungary. She'll be back in like a month and a half, two months. Um, so there's nobody to watch Sam during the day. So she had to work Saturday. So the only way she could work it out is when I got home, I closed. So I got home at about 10 o'clock. She went to work at 1030. She was there till 430. She comes in, she lays down, she gets comfortable after, you know, working all night. And probably within 15 minutes, I hear little footsteps running and there's Sammy standing at her side of the bed mommy yes Sammy I can't sleep how long have you been like I don't know well what did the clock say two o'clock you've been up for two hours why didn't you say hi to me when I came in I don't know can you sleep with me? Sure. Because she's thinking I'm asleep. I'm hearing all of it. She gets up, and then I start to say, hey, you know. And she goes, no, no, no. Go back to sleep. You have to teach, apparently. So I hear them both walk in there, and then as I'm getting ready for church, I see them just both passed out. And I said, you know... That's a mother. That's how, you know, they don't sleep, they don't slumber. They hear the cries of their little ones at night, they just run to them. And you know, a lot of times when I'm a, being a father, you know, we have a different understanding of how kids are. We handle kids differently. You know, we're like, they can handle it, they can do this, da 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 da, pushing and we bestow identity and you got this and you're amazing and all this other stuff. 
But when we've pushed them too hard, because, of course, a lot of us, though we may have maternal instincts sometime running through us because we're in line with the, our Heavenly Father, we still don't have that touch that a mother has. That no matter what their child does, whether wrong or right, that that child can run to the mother and know that they're forgiven, regardless of the offense, that they will be comforted, that they will be loved, and they can rest because she's watching care over them. So after um, kind of praying about what I was going to teach on, I get a funny text from Alexa because, you know, she's kept in the loop a lot of times of what's going to church because she has to know what slides she's going to have to put up and all that stuff. She goes, well, who's teaching? And I said, apparently I'm now. She goes, well, do you know what you're teaching on? I said, mm -hmm. she sends back, I think you should teach on this. And I was like, you know what? The Lord just told me right before you said it, so I'm going to confirm it. So this morning, I'm going to honor mothers in a very special way. In the kingdom, we honor one another because of God in us. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to stretch your thinking. I'm going to honor the motherhood of God. Because when God first created man, he was both male and female. Then Eve came out of man. So when Adam was first created, he was in the image of God, which means that God, in essence, is both masculine and feminine. Because the kingdom of God is beyond gender. It really is. When Mary comes walking up looking for Jesus, what is Jesus' response? Who is my mother? Who's my father? Who's my brother? Who's my sister? It's anyone who does the will of God. So when you walk in the will of the Lord, which is to love and to be loved, you're going to experience all facets of who God is. So this morning in the honoring of mothers, we're going to honor the motherhood of who God is. And I love that I have friends like Alexa that I can open up and that's, she's like, let's push it. I'm like, okay. So she sent me this poem, okay? I, I read it. It's very deep, kind of a little dark and brooding, but at the same time, it explains God's heart from a mother's perspective almost as if he's explaining that he understands what a mother goes through because he himself goes through it every day. So, I'm going to read it. It comes from a podcast called God Our Mother. So, to be a mother is to suffer. To travail in the dark, stretched and torn, exposed in half-naked humiliation, subjected to indignities for the sake of of new life. To be a mother is to say, this is my body, broken for you. And in the next instant, in response to the created's primal hunger, this is my body, take and eat. To be a mother is to self-empty, to neither sleep nor slumber. So attuned are you to the cries in the night, offering the comfort of yourself and the assurances of, I'm here. To be a mother is to weep over the fighting and exclusions and wounds your children inflict on one another, to long for reconciliation and brotherly love, and when all is said and done, to gather all parties, the offender and the offended, into the folds of your embrace, and to whisper in their ears, they are the beloved. To be a mother is to be vulnerable, to be misunderstood, railed against and blamed for the heartaches of the bewildered children who don't know where else to cast the angst they feel over their own existence in this perplexing universe. 
To be a mother is to hoist onto your hips those on whom your image is imprinted, bearing the burden of their weight, rejoicing in their returned affection, delighting in their wonder, and bleeding in the presence of their pain. To be a mother is to be accused of sentimentality one moment and injustice the next, to be the receiver of endless demands, absorber of perpetual complaints, and reckoner of bottomless needs. To be a mother is to be an artist, a keeper of memories past, weaver of stories untold, visionary of lives looming ahead. To be a mother is to be the first voice listened to, the first disregarded, to be a, mem a mender of broken creations and a comforter of the distraught children whose hands wrought them. To be a mother is to be a touchstone and the source, bestower of names, influencer of identities, life giver, life shaper, empath, healer, and original love. It's beautiful. It shows God's maternal nature. Because you have a line that's dri driven down by society that says, this is father, this is mother. And it's good, and together we make a whole. That's how God intended it. You bring man and female together, and there is the family unit. It's a wholeness of a representation of who God is. The mother. She's everything the father isn't. Sometimes as fathers, we can lay down our masculinity and we can comfort and love and be affectionate in the ways that a mother can be. And just the same as a mother can take on more of a commanding role, which is seen more as a masculine identity and command things to happen. And they can be successful. But where does that power and that influence come from? It comes from the Father. It comes from God. And we see him as male because as you see Jesus, you see the Father. But a lot of times, our English language can't describe God correctly because we have limitations of language. Because the Old Testament, whenever they were talking about the Father, they used masculine pronouns. But in all the verbs and all the actions of this Father was maternal. It was feminine. Loving, caring, taking care of, things like that. So, I had this little thing because of trying to prepare quickly, I didn't basically memorize things, but so I'm just gonna kind of read some things just to stretch your thinking. Like I said, I'm not, I'm not, this, this whole teaching is not to say that this is absolute truth. It's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, is it's to stretch your understanding so that you can open yourself up for God to be all things to you. If you only accept him as father and shy away from the mother part of who he is, you won't, he can't be everything. God cannot be everything to you. So we have to see this portion of him and then we can understand in our, in our natural walk how to display these parts and these attributes of God. So, Christianity has been guilty of a patriarchal history that has been oppressive of women. We all agree, it's true. As we've walked in the understanding and who Jesus is, he started expressing that women are equal. When he would talk in Song of Solomon, he would say, my bride, my equal. He saw the understanding that the both have to be together in strength, in full power, and in full equality for the church and for families to function correctly. Our, concept, our conception of God as masculine certainly contributes to our slide into patriarchy. Although written into patriarchal context, the Bible itself does not refer to God exclusively in masculine metaphors. There are, albeit few, feminine metaphors used to describe God in the Bible. 
In, in this, I want to highlight the maternal or motherly metaphors. One of the common images is God as a mother bird sheltering her children under her wings. We see this in Ruth 2.12. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have taken to refuge. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. Psalm 17.8. I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings until this disaster is past. Psalm 57.1. He covers you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. Psalm 91.4. Jesus picks up these images when he laments over Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who sent you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you are not willing. Matthew 23, 37. The images paint God as a protecting, sheltering God for his people, but a variation of this image paints God as also pushes his children to be independent and to grow strong. Mother eagles are known to teach their young ones by pushing the young deliberately out of the nest and then to swoop down and catch them so that they can learn how to fly and strengthen their wings. God guarded Jacob as the apple of his eye like an eagle that stirs up its nest and hovers over its young, that spreads its wings to catch them and carries them aloft, Deuteronomy 32, 10 through 11. Before we claim that the Bible only reinforces stereotypes of motherly warmth and care with the images of God, check out Hosea 13, 8, like a bear robbed of her cubs, I will attack them and rip them open, says the Lord. Here we see the maternal instinct to protect the children can produce wrath, such as warmth. Beware the fury of a mother. No sentimental mother image here. He's even displayed as a humanly mother. Of all the prophets, Isaiah seems to be the fondest in painting God as the actual human mother as these three verses attest. For a long time, I have kept silent. I have been quiet and I've held myself back. But now, like a woman in childbirth, I cry out and I gasp and I pant. As a mother comforts her child, so will I comfort you. You will be comforted over Jerusalem. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I, God, will never forget. Isaiah 49, 15. The last verse is one of my favorite verses. This is the person writing, not necessarily me. It is, I like it for its compassionate and faithful portrayal of God, but also because it is one of the few feminine images of God that I can use in a service. It reminds the congregation that God is beyond gender. The gender pronouns are simply metaphors to help us understand God, who is always beyond our understanding. Language about God should help us to understand and encounter God, but we should not confuse the reality of God with the limits of our language. I know that there are many conservative Christians who are uneasy with using feminine images God, but using female metaphors for God is not a radical feminist movement. As the biblical passages above show, it is just part of early Christian history. See, the thing being is, is he has so much of that maternal instinct I don't know if any of you had seen the movie The Shack. Okay. Perfect description of how to see God. It's a new way of, a new perspective. It's not limiting him to a female or a male. It limits him, it shows him in a way, it actually takes the limitations off, that he will reach you in the area and the way that you need to be reached because he cares for you. If you haven't seen it, I'm gonna spoil a little part of it because it's my favorite and I like to say it. So, the, the main character in the story has had quite a heartbreaking story and 
The thing being is, he's trying to cope with the pain of a lost child. That's all I'm going to say about that. And he encounters a letter that's written from God, and God wants him to meet at a shack. Who he comes to meet is a black woman. And he meets a carpenter. And he meets an Asian woman who is the Holy Spirit. And he's trying to wrap his brain about what he's trying to experience. And he's sitting there, and this is my favorite part. God, sitting there, making food with his child. And this guy's trying to rationalize why he's seeing what he's seeing. And he makes a little retort, and he goes, huh. I would have never pictured you in a dress. She turns to him, well, how would you picture me? You know, long white hair, long white beard. I'm paraphrasing. It's a much more powerful moment. Um, which, by the way, this is a little side note. That way that we see God is actually a storm God from some ancient religion that they just kind of influenced. Because up until Jesus, nobody really looked upon the face of God. They don't really know what he looks like. I mean, Moses got a glimpse of his rear end, but I mean... They didn't because he was too holy. Now with Jesus, because we see him, we see the Father. So now we have a glimpse of what he looks like. Okay, so they're sitting here talking, and he's like, well, what, I picture you in this. She goes, huh. Well, why do you look the way you do? Because, baby, what you've went through, you don't need a father. Because the father was abusive in his past. So God showed up to be exactly what he needed. So the thing being is, is it, that movie, I love it because it just breaks down our understanding of who God is. God, the thing is, is we have floodgates in our life. We let only so much in. And we try and make so much of it um, based on our own understanding. But what if I was to say that we could trust the Holy Spirit long enough that the Holy Spirit could take us on a journey to kind of bust off the floodgates and we can experience God in his fullness? What if we could do it? If we can do it, then we can experience God in every facet, on every level, and be in his realm and his understanding. It's quite a mind-blowing experience. Because the thing being is, is I've been in places in my life where I had the Father. He bestowed my identity. He told me, like a name passes through the Father's side, I got my identity from my Heavenly Father. But there were times when I was sitting there and I got this attack from people around me, people I trusted, people I loved, and all of a sudden my identity is in shambles. I'm hurt, I'm broken, I'm bruised, and although I love my father, it's not necessarily the touch I need. I don't need that strong male presence to be like, you got this. And God showed up in his tenderness and his kindness and in his embrace. And some of it I could have created. He didn't care. Just like a mom doesn't care how it happened, why it happened. Her baby is hurt and she wants to console. She wants to love. She wants to be tender. And you know how fathers, stop babying that kid. 
You got to stop babying that kid. It is innately impossible in a woman that's a mother to not baby their children even when they're 35 years old. It's in their nature. They don't see that child, they don't see that 35 year old man or that 42 year old woman. What they're looking at is they're seeing that same little baby that they hugged and they kissed when they were little. Guess what? Tell you how our God sees us innocent, pure, trying to figure it out, weak. And though we do things that are stupid sometimes. <laughs> By the way, side note, do you ever realize that God likens us to sheep? Have you ever figured that out why? Sheep are stupid. He's not saying it as an insult because when you're, when you're kind of pure and innocent and naive, you have a tendency to flock to areas of strength for safety. So it requires a dependent. But sheep are stupid. Any possible threat, even if they're not threatening, come walking in, they all spring out of and all this other place. Thank you, Lord, that we have a good shepherd who sits at the doorway and keeps us in. Just saying, because he wasn't, I'd be running. So the thing being is, is I don't... My heart is to just, for me, for everybody that I encounter, is to let go. You know, you hear that term, let go and let God, but really what you're letting go is not letting go of circumstances. It's letting go of your preconceived notion of what God can do and how he's going to do it. Because I'm telling you, you're not going to go spiraling out of control and you're not going to go spiraling out. You have got to trust the Holy Spirit in you stronger than you trust anything else. You have to. Holy Spirit is not going to lead you astray. It's the very Spirit of God. And the thing being is, is, Your mom can be mad at you, and you know you can just flick a certain smile or do a certain cute thing, and they will melt like wax. You have to believe that God's the same way. You just look to him, and he's like, come here. You know, let me just love on you, kiss on you, adore you, because I made you. When you were in your mother's womb, I knew you. For you were in my womb first. You were in the womb of heaven. Your ideas, everything about you was being created. And like an, like an artist, I was just creating, breathing with excitement as your mom was excited to have you and in anticipation, I was waiting for you to come to life. Because I knew you were destined to do amazing and great things. And I'm going to be alongside you as your father, as your mother, as your sister, as your brother, as your best friend. I will be all of them. I will be the only thing you need. Don't hold me back. So, in all of that because I don't want to keep you very long. I think I got the point across. Because it's Mother's Day, and I want you to be families. I know that I know that I know that I know that in his loving embrace and hearing his heartbeat, you will grow in ways that you never thought you could grow, ever. And in that, in honoring the motherhood of who God is, we can honor the mothers here. Because in the kingdom, we honor Christ in each other, and that's what glorifies one another. That's what makes us shine. So this morning, mothers, I glorify you, and I glorify the father and the mother. 
and the sun in you because that's who makes you shine. That's what makes your face radiant. That's what makes you and gives you grace. I know that sometimes as mothers, because I see it all the time, in all of the love and the affections, just like that poem said, that you pour on the child, they will turn around and bite you sometimes. And you're like, hey, I was just trying to love you. We do the same thing with God. But the funny thing is, they don't hold any judgment, any condemnation, because they just go right back to loving. And our Father's just like that. So to kind of just conclude this little synopsis of the mother, I asked Alexa to do something for me, and she's going to do something in her discomfort. But she had an experience of letting God be a mother to her. And I felt it fitting with motherhood to have a feminine perspective of things. And... It's just how she processed, and I think it's a way, and we learn from each other's testimony. We overcome the enemy by the blood of the lamb, which we already have, and the word of each other's testimony. So I was like, if you will do it in your boldness, she's like, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. I said, can you do it? I don't want to do it. And I get texts in the middle of the worship, I'll do it if you want me to. I'm like, okay, thank you. (laughs) So thank you, Alexa. It was funny because just as, like, I was thinking, like, oh, I should text him. And then Alan played You Make Me Brave. I'm like, dang it. (laughs) Because that's how that works, right? Yeah. I'm shorter than you, so I can't be behind. Um. I'm like shaking. Um, so let's see. In January, um, I started an online inner healing course, basically. Um, and part of the course was that you went through these guided meditations. Um, there, a big aspect of the course was that you were you partnering with God in your imagination. And I'm, I'm a graphic designer, I'm an artist, I, I need that visual, that visual is really helpful for me. Um, so one of the meditations, um, well, back up a little bit. Um, think of your heart as like a house and you're the landlord of that house. And when you invite Jesus in, Jesus is a tenant in that house. But there are still rooms in that house that you don't always let God into because you're ashamed of them or whatever. So part of this was going into those spaces and being willing to let God into those spaces to turn the light on in those dark places in your heart. Um, so part of the medita- the part of the, this experience was that you were supposed to picture whatever aspect of God felt safest, whatever manifestation of God felt safest, whether that was Father God or Jesus or a dove or a lion like Aslan, whatever it was. Which, side note, um, I've actually heard that for people who can't trust men or women, like people who have come out of human trafficking, God actually shows up for them as a dog, like a Labrador, to love on them. So God, like, I love things that kind of break my brain on this sort of stuff. Um, So I had gone through this at the recording. So I went through it once before, and I saw Father God, and it was okay, which you never really want to talk about an encounter with God. Like, oh, it's okay, you know. Um, And this time, I went through it, and God showed up as a woman. And (laughs) I always get emotional at this part. it's really important to who I am. Like, like, I have this need where I need to feel understood. And when God showed up as a woman, it was like, it, it was like this deep exhale when you ha- don't realize you've been holding your breath. I didn't have to explain anything. I didn't have to, nothing. And I didn't even realize I was doing that inside myself. I, I had no idea. Um, so... We know in our heads that 
you know, like John said, it's like we know in our heads that God is mother and father, but all of our pronouns and all of our systems in the world, everything is set up as God is the father, God is he, God is all these things. And so it's like we only see this, you know, we only see in part. Um, and to feel that level of understood, it's like I didn't have to explain myself. I didn't have to justify anything. And so so we go up to the door of this room, and, and it's very like you don't, God doesn't force himself on you. He doesn't, nothing. It's all about if you're willing, if you're willing to, to set it down, if you're willing to hand it over. Um, and so part of this thing was, okay, well, if you're willing to hand over the key to this room, in the house of your heart, um, you know, you do that. <laughs> I hand over the key, and we get to this door, and it's not just like one lock, it's like lock, 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 locks from top to bottom. Um, and we go into this room, and God turns the light on, and she just starts sweeping the room, because the room was covered in broken glass. The floor was covered in broken glass. And <laughs> she started sweeping. And I, I had this thought, I'm like, a mother would do that. I'm like, that's, a woman would do that. Like, I'm not a mom, but, like, I've seen how my mom acts. And um, I used to be a manager at Leota's in Oluwalu, and I remember walking in there, and you instantly see, okay, this needs to be cleaned, that needs to be cleaned. Like, you just, you just go, you see it, and you act. And um, we walk up to this box in the room, and um, so a little bit of backstory. Um, I was in a relationship for about six months last year that ended very abruptly and without warning. And it like derailed me. And I basically felt for months like I had been walking around with this gaping heart wound. Like you could ask me like, what color is the sky? And I would just be like, what? Because I was completely, I felt like I was bleeding. Um, the part of your brain that registers physical pain is actually the same region that registers emotional pain. So your brain doesn't know the difference. Um, we walk into this room, and we walk up to the biggest cardboard box. There's all these tables, and there's cardboard boxes on them, and the biggest one in the room is that one. And we walk up to it, and I just start crying. Um, and Mother God, she just walks up to me and embraces me, and she starts telling me about how my heart is is intricate and big and all these things and I just cried and the box got smaller it wasn't the biggest box in the room anymore it was still there um, but ever since then like I came out of that experience and I didn't feel like I was bleeding anymore I didn't feel like my my heart didn't feel broken the way it had anymore. It was like I could breathe again, I could function again. Even my mom was like, wow, you're like normal-ish. <laughs> She's like, it's working. <laughs> but, um, and ever since then, it's like, those encounters have, encounters are, are, are interesting because you can always go back to that. It's like in the Old Testament when God talks about, you know, says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, if I remember correctly from my Bible classes in college, those are kind of like a signifier, like remember who I am. So when you have those encounters in that history with God, you can go back to those spaces and be like, okay, remember when God did this? I remember when God did that. And remember and, you know, um, and so every time, so when I'm having a hard time, because the masculine representation of God was the point, like not God, but that was the point of highest loss. I think that's what Paul Young calls it, the point of highest loss. And so that's part of why um, God is a, a black woman in his book. Um, but I, I can keep going back to that space. And sometimes when I'm having a hard time with that picture, it's like, okay, I need the mother of God and she shows up, and it's like, oh, okay, I can keep going. Um, so, yeah, that's all.
Oh, thank you. See, I, 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 sure. Sorry. Okay. Thank you so much. Last week, um, Giandria and Alvaro and I were in in Reading, and we went through through Sozo training, and and uh, we had an amazing weekend, and. So much of what John's talking about and what Alexa just shared, which is so powerful, it, Sozo is nothing but praying with people and trying to draw them into being able to communicate with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? And, and for me, it just uh, ironically or logically or it follows that that, that when I, I didn't want to go through the Sozo session. Okay, Alvaro signed up for it, Giandra signed up for it, you know, their own personal Sozo to go through it. And I said, no, 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 I'm fine. I, end up, I ended up being the, the, the uh, demonstration for the men. So I had my own Sozo in front of everybody. Um, <laughs> And it was messy and good, but but what hap what what happened for me was that God showed up not in that big white flowing, gray you know white flowing beard. And he showed up as 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 an as an older man on my level with a comforting lap, right. And this, this led into a, a, a healing of, of a distancing with Jesus that I'd had for 35 years. 35 years ago, I said, during one of these helpful conferences doing guided imagery, they said, picture Jesus. And I pictured Jesus in that corner and me in this corner. I said, Jesus, you stay in that corner, I'll stay in this corner, and I'll be just fine. And all of that came back to me during this session. And all I could picture then was Jesus wrapping me in his arms. Yeah? And for two solid weeks, I've been getting this question in my mind. I've been getting this question in my mind long before we went to Reading. Can you trust me? Can you trust me? And, and that story of it from Matthew 19, where the rich young ruler, who, by the way, the Aramaic says he's a teenager, comes up to Jesus and he says, what do I need to gain eternal life? Jesus says, do all of these things. He lists them and, and, the, and the young man says, I've done all these things. He says, one thing you lack. He says, go sell all you have and give it to the poor and then come and follow me and you will have life beyond what you can ever imagine. <sighs> Sometimes in our lives we say, what do we lack? Sometimes in our lives, Jesus is saying, what are you clinging on to? What's that room that, you're, that, that, that you've got locked up? What are you clinging on to so hard that keeps us from our intimacy, that keeps us from sharing So I wanted to share that with you because what a power, powerful thing that God is doing in this body right here. Because what Alexa goes through, what John goes through, what everybody, go, we hear from the Spirit and he doesn't work. <laughs> he works individually, but he works in concert. So powerful. Okay, so I wanted to share that with you because he wants to communicate. He wants us to be intimately communicating with him. He wants to talk with us. He wants to share with us. He wants 
to share with us because friends share what's going on with each other, Jesus said. A servant doesn't know, but a friend knows. A friend knows the heart. Yeah. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being vulnerable. I keep trying to encourage her because I always hear her. We always banter and talk God things. I love our God talks. But I'm like, oh my gosh, you need to share. Like, she's got more wealth in her than we know of. Like, she's an untapped resource, as a lot of you are too. Um, just step out in boldness. That was one of the four or five pillars, yeah, the, of a strong church is that we walk out in boldness. You just respond, you know, like, Look at just in point in what I did. I didn't, it was the last second, found out at 9 o'clock, 9.15, and God orchestrates a beautiful tapestry. But why? Because we all trust the Holy Spirit to do it because this is his show. This is his doing. We are his children. If we just let go and let him just orchestrate in the ways that he wants to do it. It's different for every person. Every journey is different. But every single person in this, this house glorifies Jesus because they know that he's the one who purchased it all. But we encounter the Lord in different ways and different needs because he understands what we need. The last thing that I wanted on the mother... Is, this is from Bible Gateway, talking about the motherhood of God. It's very interesting. Yeah, they have their own teaching. But I read this one, and I thought it was so beautiful. It's called A Mother's Silence. When in trouble, the mother receives her child without asking many questions. A mother's intuition tells her what is wrong. It is enough for her to know that her child is in distress. She may guess much and fear more, but comfort is her first consideration. Explanations can wait. How like the motherhood of God, God does not probe the wound when there is power to heal. How beautifully tender is the mother comfort of God. He asks no questions, utter no reproach, demands no explanation. He has not the scrutiny of a detective, but the sympathy of a devoted parent. One phrase, or one phase of this silent comfort is what Dr. Carroll calls the mother's inarticulation. When a child flees to his mother for consolation with what or how does mother comfort her distressed one? Not with many words, which often increases the child's grief. Mother is wiser. And catching up the child bends over him and smothers him with kisses of love. And in this silence, his poignant pain is healed. Silent sympathy is a soothing balm. If it was not anything mother said, but simply her own soothing touch and presence that brought relief. Thus it is with God, who with a strange, inarticulate comfort, calms the troubled breast. He asks no questions, strikes no wounds. With, we carry to him our tortured doubt, worldly loss, stab of heart, deep gashes of disappointment, ruinous sin within the soul, and he comforts us with his forgiving presence. What we weep over may remain, yet in carrying all to the mother heart of God, we are comforted. We kneel before him, but we cannot see his radiant form. We speak to him, but receive no articulate answer. Yet we leave his presence calmed and consoled as a child folded within the breast in the silence of love. Mothers, again, I honor you. Hey, I just wanted to
tap on to what everybody's saying because it seems like there's a thread in the spirit of the Lord. And that thread is, is that God's going to appear to you in the manner in which you need him most, right? And I wanted to bring a couple scriptures just to kind of back that up, right? So Jesus, you remember he got transfigured and then Mary, you know, went to the gravesite and she saw Jesus and, you know, the first thought out of her head was, is where have you laid my master, you know? And she replied, I mean, and then he, she said, you know, she thinking that he was the gardener and Jesus said something to her. And she, within that, she could hear the voice of God and she knew it was God. She knew it was her master, even though he was in a different form. And then there were some other stories, right, of the road in the Maus, I think, or I'm trying to remember the story exactly, but the story goes something like two men, they were walking along the way, and they saw a man, and this man started talking to them about how Jesus was going to come and be raised again, and so forth, and they, they didn't recognize the man, even though he was Jesus, he was Jesus. They thought he was somebody else. But as soon as he broke bread and blessed it, they realized it was Jesus. And they were like, whoa, God was with us. So God changes his appearance. He changes his appearance. He changes his appearance. He appears to you in the manner in which you can receive him. And I think that's the thread in which we've been trying to talk to today. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Ooh, I'm loving it. Okay. Yeah. I like this. This is like a Corinthians church. Who has a song? I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, so, again, mothers, we honor you. We honor the aspects and the characteristics of God through you. We say that you are blessed. You are whole. You are well. You are prosperous in everything that you touch. Fathers, you'll have your time. But mothers, you, you carve out a beautiful place in the world for who you are and what you do. And we thank you for it. We thank you that you've stayed true, that you've fought the quiet battles on your knees in prayer over your children, over your household. And we thank you for it. And I just want to just pray over you, Lord. We just ask that you just give them a world-changing, record-breaking year this year. Lord, we know that you're doing something in the kingdom. And like I saw last week, a tidal wave coming. Lord, I know that it's not just for the men, but it's for the women as well, for the children. Lord, I thank you that in this, the mothers will arise as mighty women of God with voices and things like Alexa stepping forward and speaking with power and with might so in it that every man and woman and child will see our good works and they will glorify you. They will glorify who you are. And Lord, we thank you that we are sheep that know your voice. And whatever form that you show up to heal us, we know it's because you love us and that we will recognize you. Because we know your heart. We know your heart. So Lord, we just thank you for fresh revelations, for fresh testimonies as we move forward. And Lord, I thank you for the mothers again. I thank you that you're just going to set them up today. Lord, just give them divine appointments, surprise gifts, and just show them how much you love them in mighty and massive ways. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, guys. Happy Mother's Day. Go out and give them heaven.